Hey guys, I hope you're well. I'm just going to be going over chapter four, but mostly your white paper assignment. So chapter four goes over research. Please make sure that you are reading the entire chapter thoroughly because it really is one of the most important chapters in our textbook. Um, if you scroll down, you'll see that there are two different types of sources. We have primary research and secondary research. Whenever I say primary research, I'm referring to field work. They are they're synonyms. Um, field work, as you can see here, it's data that you personally collect about the topic on your own. So just to give you some examples, these can be experiments that you conduct, surveys that you conduct, questionnaires that you give, any direct observations that you're taking with note keeping and dates, obviously, any interviews. These are all examples of primary research. This is a really great idea to include in your white paper, but some of you may not have time to do that before um, you submit your white paper. So at least consider conducting primary research for your midterm. So just keep that in mind. Secondary research is what we'll be focusing on mostly, and I just want you guys to check it out. There are three different types, and if I could draw a pyramid right here, I would. Scholarly sources would be at the top, and I'll just explain why they are our most credible sources. Then we have in the middle professional sources. They're definitely credible, but not as credible as scholarly. And our least credible sources are popular. So I'm just going to very quickly go through them. Um, our scholarly sources, the key word here is that they are peer reviewed journal articles um, or books, and they also are written by multiple people in the field who are either well-known or who are researchers or who are maybe PhD candidates or professors, people like that. Um, the thing to keep in mind is that these are normally published in journals. Um, most of these journals you will access on the library website and they oftentimes will include discussions and references that are accepted concepts and models for fixing the problem. The other thing I want you to know, a good way to characterize them is that they can be really difficult to read and this is because they include a very complex and specialized vocabulary the audience of these types of journals are not your everyday person it's normally people who are researchers in that field so that's why that vocabulary is so much more complex um, the other thing i want you just to take note of a lot of times there will be multiple authors not always but a lot of times for scholarly sources and when you're researching if you check out the library video that I made for you. In the left hand side when you're searching you can check off peer reviewed and that will guarantee that any search you conduct is giving you only peer reviewed or scholarly sources. But whatever your source count is for your midterm, your final, even your white paper, you really want at least half of your sources to be scholarly. So that's just something to be mindful of. These are the ones that are going to persuade your reader the most. In the middle, um, still definitely credible, just not as credible as our scholarly sources, are our professional sources. And these are normally written by professionals in the field. And these come in the form of newsletters, journals sometimes, magazines and websites, sometimes even blogs. But these are written by people in the field. So since you know I'm a high school teacher, if I were to write an article about my experience teaching literature and that got published in the New Jersey Teachers Union magazine, that would be considered a professional source because I'm a person in that field and I'm writing about my experience. Oftentimes these articles um, will include successful companies or methods in fixing a problem or addressing it. So it's a great place to find models of success. Our least credible sources, I don't want you to think that they're bad sources, but you just should really be trying to use your uh, scholarly sources and your professional sources the most. But popular sources are sources that are easily accessible to anyone. You can find them by typing in Google, you can find them by looking on Facebook, um, or picking up a newspaper or a magazine. So these come in the format of newspaper articles, magazine articles, and websites that are readily and easily accessible and available to the public, and they are written to a broad audience and are generally called popular sources. So the whole broad audience thing means that they are written in a way where if they're talking about some complex neurological concept, someone who has no background in that could understand the article because it's written for the general public. So I hope that that clarifies. But these are very easy to find. Um, they have the least credibility. 
and I don't want you to think that they're bad. The main purpose of them really is to supplement the scholarly and professional sources that you are finding. So just keep that in mind. Okay, so this is just, it goes over how to research all of the different P's. It's definitely good information. I'm not going to go over this, but I do want you to read it. So you're just reading through chapter four. It also has a really great section on searching for theory and searching for models of success. It gives you examples. Mm -hmm. So please make sure you're reading that. Um, but what I want to go over is your white paper assignment. And what I want to do is just explain what the purpose of a white paper is, how it should be structured, and how you should sort of be thinking about it since this is your first assignment that's due. Um, the white paper is a document it's a paper that you're creating that describes a current problem and the problem that you will be writing about is the problem that you are sticking with for the whole semester and in a thread of comments that i had you guys contribute to you've written down several ideas that you have for topics and i'm getting back to those today and tomorrow morning just to give you feedback so you can definitely choose so once you choose your topic for the semester you're going to be writing um, this white paper and your main goal is to document and quantify the problem. So when you're documenting and quantifying, you have to find proof. That means data and statistics and quotes that prove that the problem exists within a given population. So right off the bat, you're seeing you, you're tackling two of the six P's, problem and population. If you continue, you should see that mentioning a funding source is definitely a good idea um, so you want to make sure that you're mentioning who could fund this some of you might have a person in mind um, others you might just have at this point in time just a foundation that might be worthwhile so just make sure that you're considering that going on um, it's also supposed to help you collate and organize information and test the viability of your topic um, you must pay close attention to the scope so I gave you guys the example of choosing a really big, broad topic like world hunger would never, ever work. It just would never work for a paper of this size, and it's just not viable. Making sure that you're narrowing your scope and making it reasonable is the best thing to do. So remember, some of my pieces of advice when I was talking about that is choosing a population that's close to you and one that's from a smaller community, perhaps a community that you're a part of. Um, your white paper is brief, so if you're just looking for length or you have questions about that, it's one full page to two full pages in length. It should not be less than a page. It should not be more than two pages. Please be mindful that it's single spaced. Um, so that's really important. Um, please make sure that it includes field work if you get to that. If not, just save that step for your midterm. And just to refresh your memory, field work is primary sources, which means um, all of your data that you're sort of collecting on your own, whether it's through a survey, through a questionnaire. So if you can't get to that yet, just try to save that step for the midterm. Um, so the paper itself, when you're done, should definitely address the six Ps. So you should address the problem population and patron, your funding source, but you should at least have maybe one model of success. So you want to try to find another community or population that's similar to yours that has found a solution. Um, and you want to make sure that you're showing how it's been successful. You should mention a plan based off of that model of success. It might be vague at this point, but that's okay. And you should at least mention a price or what you might need to gather data and content for a price. Um, so there are seven things that it should do, and I'll let you read through these more specifically, but it should identify with people. Um, it just means that you must make sure that everything you're writing about would appeal to your funding source and it should also be pretty convincing we should want to read more and we should care about that population um, it should also point to a problem we need to understand that the problem is a problem so by that i just mean if you're choosing the topic of um, anxiety amongst transfer students you must give data points that show that that's an actual issue in transfer students and then you want to maybe narrow your scope to Rutgers what is Rutgers doing um, do transfer students at Rutgers have anxiety why what causes the anxiety what is the anxiety result in so that just gives you different ways to quantify that issue it should be a paper that faces complexity it shouldn't be something like the problem is that 
Students are food insecure. We're going to build a food bank. Done. That does not show that your problem faces complexity. You want to make sure that you're showing that it can be solved in so many different ways and that there's one specific way that can solve it the best. Um, it should also suggest lines of research. So some of you are going to be thinking about choosing topics that are so new that they don't really have much research out there to support it. So when you're doing research at first, you just want to make sure that whatever you're researching has ample sources to support it that you could use. Um, you should be, as I said before, mentioning paradigms. Those are just your models of success, maybe pieces of theory. Um, it should be an original topic. It shouldn't be something really common and basic like kids have concussions from football. Let's fix that. That's too basic. You want something more specific um, and not something as vague. And it should also stay reasonable. It should stay within reach. Um, you don't want to do something that's really over the top, that's too big, that's interfering with changing laws. You want it to be reasonable. Okay, so on the next page, we have a couple of sample white papers. Before we even get into Jess's example, I just want to show you structurally what's going on. Um, she has a heading, and the heading is just three lines. It has her name, then it goes into white paper, and then it has the due date. You should have the exact same heading, single spaced. You'll see hers has a bolded title. It's the title for her paper. You should do the same. And then she has, as you can see, a single spaced paper. There are no indentations. It's just justified format block formatting and if she's separating paragraphs she just has a space you can see that for her she has um, one page and then it goes on to the second page and then she has her work cited just so you know your work cited should start on a fresh page um, but you can see jess's paper is slightly over a page so that's the structure remember one to two pages without the work cited Please make sure that you have at least three sources. Jess does not, and that's problematic. I'm going to talk about her paper, and um, I just want you to pause and read her paper, and when you're done, just come back into this video for the discussion of it. So Jess starts her paper out with an interesting hook, and she talks about how politics are stereotypically known as a topic that you should not discuss and i think that's an interesting thing to bring up but a couple of things that um are good about this is she leads into why students need to be educated in civic engagement and how it can help them in their future um, she also mentions her population and she says high schools in new jersey i will tell you that that's too vague you would want to maybe choose one specific high school that you could focus on Focusing on every high school in New Jersey, think about how much of a mess that would be and how crazy that would be to write a paper that addresses them all equally. But we do have the focus here, which is good. Um, she also talks about how public schools are funded, and she also talks about how um, maybe this class that she wants to create could replace health or gym. And I want you to know that that's a problem because health and gym class are a requirement by law so that sort of sounds irrational and it almost weakens her uh, proposal a little bit so maybe doing something a little bit different um, maybe insinuating that it could count as an elective or that it could be something that students um, can take as an after-school club or something like that but that needs to be rethought um, she also talks about how fake news is going around and how that can really impact students in a negative way and she talks about how um, the class needs to be taught actively for the best results and she has some research which i think is good um, she should definitely expand there but it's a good point to raise she also brings up the importance of voting and how all students voices matter and how that needs to be relayed to them how they can make a difference and i think that's a great thing to mention um, she also uses another quote but once again she only has one source she really should have more than one source and a couple of other things she talks about the synthesis of the course including history and political science and any other related discipline which i think is a good thing um, she also talks about um, how students will benefit from this plan and how it will make them better people um, and people who are willing to make better change for the communities that they are a part of. So you can see that this is a good example. Um, if you have more questions about it, just shoot me an email. The last thing I want to point you to is on the next page we have Jake's. So you get another exemplar that you're more than welcome to look at yourself. 
Uh, once again, just let me know if you have questions about this assignment.